Good evening, everyone. I'm Jane Pointer. In this episode of AZ Illustrated Science, we discuss doctor-patient relations and how important non-verbal communication is to bedside manner. Also, the effects of over-parenting. And first responders get involved in preventing teen driving accidents. But first, here's a look at today's top stories. An appeals court today struck down an Arizona law that bans abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy. Three judges of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled unanimously on the 2012 law. Supporters of the law said it was meant to protect women's health and prevent fetal pain. The circuit court had blocked implementation of the law last year pending its ruling. The court said U.S. Supreme Court cases back to 1973 mean Arizona's law is unconstitutional. An appeal to the Supreme Court is expected. More information was released today from the investigative files of Tucson's January 8, 2011 shooting. The Pima County Sheriff's Department made available 600 photos from its investigation of the attack in which six people died and former Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and 12 others were wounded. The photos showed the gun and magazine used in the shooting, other evidence, and scenes of the strip mall parking lot where it occurred. The images released today do not show shooting victims. Southern Arizona's first big wildfire of the season is still burning out of control six miles south of Patagonia. Federal fire officials say the Soldier Basin fire has burned 3,800 acres. About 200 firefighters are on the lines setting fires upslope in the rugged Coronado National Forest. No structures are threatened. The federal wildfire tracking system reports that this is the only active wildfire in the state. And that's a look at today's top news. Ranch on Tucson's east side, medical students are getting a crash course in good communication skills from a team of four-legged teachers. Gisela Tellis has the story. He's under general anesthesia with... Uh, Life as a medical brain. student isn't just about learning anatomy or practicing how to do a physical. At the University of Arizona College of Medicine, it can also include a little horsing around. I want you to meet him. I can go, come on. Okay, I can put a lot of energy on him. Students in Dr. Alan Hamilton's From Barnyard to Bedside class are learning to be better doctors from horses. You know, when you have a thousand pound patient, you really respect them. Eventually, with all of this stuff going on with the horses, they gradually realize, I should be very aware of what I do as a doctor. And part of what affects what I do as a doctor is how I think in, in my, about myself and how aware I am of what I do. Uh, I've had a cold for the last couple of days. So uh, when did you get the cold? Uh, about three days ago. Well, like when? On the weekend? Um, and anybody else sick at home? No, not that okay, I can Okay, so how long? Have you been in February? I, I don't okay, know. Okay, so the point is, <laughs> believe it or not, the average patient, average, gets interrupted within 29 and a half seconds of the time they start telling the doctor what's wrong with them. Hamilton, a UA professor of neurosurgery and horse whisperer, works with the horses on his 17-acre ranch, Rancho Bosque, to teach students the awareness and nonverbal communication skills they'll need to really connect with their patients. So our bodies have all of that power. We've just sort of forgotten about it. But that's really what we convey to people with our bodies. We sort of have an instinctive reaction to body language, OK? So I'm going to, Ryan, you did a great job. Thank you. And I'm going to swap you out. You know, I mean, there's a big difference between, you know, the difference between, I think, being a doctor and a healer is the doctor is just sort of giving you information and is a spectator. And the healer says, we're in this together. Hamilton was a horse lover long before he was a healer. Although he grew up in New York City, he learned about horses and country living during visits to his grandfather. I'm going to try and move predictably. The so need to have horses in his life was what drew Hamilton to Tucson and ultimately to Rancho Bosque. We actually moved. I was at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. We actually moved out here because they had a great cancer center here. And I was, uh, you know, I was involved in surgery on brain tumors, that kind of thing. And then um, we really wanted a place where you could raise horses. And that was, you know, that was, those were the two requirements. Had to have a lot of brain tumors and you had to have a place to keep horses. 
But Hamilton kept yeah. his medical That's world and his horse world separate hold on to my shoulder for until he noticed that he acted like a different person in each of his two worlds. And I began to notice all this crazy stuff that I was doing, you know, like putting up x-rays and talking to the x-rays and not talking to the patient. You know, I had the patient behind me, which is ridiculous. And then, um, you know, it, we, it just got worse and worse. So then I started thinking, man, I would never use that kind of body language training horses. A lot of people evaluate the thyroid like this. He wondered if spending time with horses would help his colleagues and students work more effectively with their patients. Since the whole thing had originated with horses, I said, well, it's kind of a crazy idea, but let me try it. And it worked. Just slow him down with your, your breathing. Hamilton has now been teaching his From Barnyard to Bedside class for 12 years and has shared his curriculum with a number of other medical schools. Slow him down, and I want you to turn your back towards him. Okay, just wait. Now, you see him coming towards you? Okay, so I want you to just start walking away with him now. Good, he's licking his lips. Okay, walk around in a big circle. Because the horses are so sensitive to nonverbal cues, they force students to tune in to their own emotions and body language. When students learn to quiet themselves and stay in the moment, Hamilton says, they can finally listen to their patients. Horses are very holistic. They, they're looking at everything around them, and they're looking at, and they don't care about your, your, what you say, the lies you tell yourself or tell other people. They go, if you're present, I'll feel it. If you're not present, I'll know it. You gradually discover that it isn't about the horses. You're not working on the horses. You end up working on yourself. So what happens with these students, which to me is the amazing part, is I'll have students four years later come back and say, that was the most important class I ever had in medical school. And I say, why? And they go, because it really taught me about myself. Take the step back and then look at the hip. Now. Second year medical student Engel Ottman found her first time at Rancho Bosque so transformative that she's come back to do it again. Good. I think as doctors, we're very verbal people and we're used to using our brains and our words to solve problems. And what I like about this is you have to calm down and connect with your energy and your body. And since in medicine, we are interacting with the patient's body and energy and emotions, I think that's why this is particularly valuable. For Hamilton, every trip out to his pastures is a valuable opportunity to learn. I once said to somebody, if you look at a herd of horses, just imagine a crowd of Tibetan monks coming towards you. They're like sensei. We're walk I'm learning every single day. Every single day those horses are teaching me something. And I, you know, I think at night they go, man, it's the dumbest person we've ever met. He's always learning. but." I'm learning patience from them. I learned to get rid of my emotion. I learned, you know, when I work with a horse, I better not be in a hurry. I, you know, sometimes I wish they had taught me as much as they have when I was younger and parenting my kids because they really taught me to slow down and they taught me to dwell in the moment and not say, hey, you know, we got 20 minutes here. So, but, you know, as soon as that happens with a horse, the horse goes, okay, you got no integrity today, just leave. You know, but if I say to myself, well, as long as it takes, you know, and whatever's been bothering me out there, when I'm with you in a horse, I'm totally absorbed in that horse. So I learn every single day. I can honestly say that. Okay, so let's go these four teams. And, we'll and now Hamilton can honestly say that he and his horses are helping to shape the next generation of healers. Finding a doctor with good bedside manner is always a bonus, but new research suggests it can also have a measurable effect on our physical and mental health. One researcher who's probing how nonverbal communication shapes our lives is behavioral scientist Chris Segrin, a professor in the University of Arizona College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, who joins us now. So thanks for coming in and talking with us about Thank this. You. So nonverbal communication can really have that much of an effect that it can actually change my health and well-being? Yes, it can. The majority of meaning that is conveyed between two people when they interact is conveyed through nonverbal channels more than verbal channels. 
So g give me an example here. So, so here I am, in, I'm in hospital and a doctor comes in. Here's a classic example in American healthcare, someone who has heart disease. And the, the physician needs to both break the news to that individual and more importantly, advocate for some change in their lifestyle, like diet, exercise, quit smoking. And we know those are behaviors that are difficult to change. A physician who can approach a patient with a kind demeanor, highly involved, showing caring and concern, empathy, is gonna be more persuasive and able to actually get that patient to affect that change in his or her life for the better. The issues with mental health deal largely with satisfaction with the patient-provider the, the patient -provider relationship. And to the extent that you're satisfied with your provider and you feel they care about you, you're more likely to return and listen carefully to what they have to say to you. So is this something that is taught regularly to new doctors, or is this something that we need to put more effort into now? Well, it is becoming an increasing part of a curricula nowadays, although historically it has not been something that's been paid much attention to at all. But you are seeing a number of innovative programs throughout the world, actually, where people are now being paid some attention to as part of their training, the importance of what we call bedside mannerisms and demeanor and nonverbal communication is a big part of that. And, and the kinds of skills that, that, uh, that they need to have, what, what kind of skills are we talking about? These involve things like that have to do with communicating affiliation and empathy, eye contact, um, posture, gesturing, what we call paralanguage, which is how we say something, our speech rate, our tone of voice, and even listening skills as well as part of the entire package of communication that makes us appear concerned, aware, and really wanting the best interests of the patient. And so, so these animal, working with animals, you think really translates? I mean, I've done a lot of working with animals and you can really tell how they respond to body language. Right, so as you know, animals are the masters of nonverbal communication because they don't use a language, as, at least as we understand it. So all of their communication is nonverbal. And it's adaptive to their survival to be able to read nonverbal cues very carefully. So when humans interact with animals, they get to work with really the planet's masters of nonverbal communication. And that directly translates to, to the medical In world. many ways, yes, it does. Let me use a specific example. One thing we call predictive touch. Most human beings don't care for being touched when they don't see it coming, if you will. They, they alarm, they're shocked and alarmed when that happens. So are animals. So when we work with animals, we have to learn how to approach them, touch them in a predictable way that generates a positive response in them. If, they don't, if, if, if we don't do that, they will figure that out pretty quickly and react accordingly. So what about your research? So, so talk about your research a little bit. Well, one thing we have found, we've been studying, uh, myself and one of my PhD students, the effects of sleep deprivation over a long haul shift um, at, uh, in a medical setting. And what we find is that what often happens with sleep deprivation is a deterioration of many of these skills that are adaptive to providing patient-centered care. So how do you mean? You go, if, if you're a patient that's early in somebody's shift, you're gonna get uh, more bedside manner than at the end of the shift? Basically, yes, you'll get a little bit more time with that individual. They might joke with you a little bit more. They might be a little more lighthearted. They might take a little bit more time to listen. Whereas as time goes on, and we're talking 18 to 24 hours in some cases, things get rushed. There's a, little, a lot less of that empathic nonverbal communication. Yeah, I'm sure after 18 hours, being completely patient is not necessarily <laughs> easy to do. Not at all. And, and the student, the PhD student who did this um, was there in the middle of the night talking to patients, talking to doctors. What, yes, what did... Stacy Pasolacqua is her name, and she would actually go to the medical center at the beginning of a shift and then catch that same individual at the end of their shift. And sometimes these shifts started at 8 in the morning, sometimes they started at midnight, and they ended at all kinds of different hours. And it was important for her to assess the way the physician was feeling about the patients at both the beginning and the end of that shift. And um, so what about the, the skills in the real setting? So you have a, a new doctor who's just learned all of these skills, maybe gone to one of these animal, mm -hmm. animal uh, settings. Mm -hmm. How does that then work for them in the real life? Does that actually, uh, do, do they pick it up quickly? Well, that's a very good question because it, nonverbal communication skills we have learned over our lifetime. And so it is unlikely that they can be changed immediately, but the beginning of change has to start with knowledge. So training people, giving them experience, with, in, for example, with animals is the beginning to showing people what really matters. And then hopefully through repetition and actually putting it into practice, it becomes part of our everyday repertoire. 
Thank you very much. This was really fascinating. You're very welcome. So we'll continue our discussion with Chris Segrin about his work on the effects of helicopter parenting and what it means for the up and coming generation of kids after this short break. Rescue crews sifted through the rubble in Moore, Oklahoma, continuing a desperate search for survivors of yesterday's monster tornado. Good evening, I'm Gwen Eiffel. And I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the NewsHour tonight, we get the latest on the devastation caused by the twister that claimed at least two dozen lives and injured more than 200. Then Judy Woodruff reports on a Senate panel grilling two former IRS commissioners on how the agency targeted conservative groups. We examine charges the Justice Department overreached its authority by tracking reporters to crack down on leaks. Apple CEO faced blistering questions on Capitol Hill today. Margaret Warner looks at whether the tech giant used offshore companies to skirt paying billions in taxes. And we close with Miles O'Brien on the legacy of astronaut Sally Ride and her goal to get more girls to study science, technology, engineering, and math. To get young girls interested in, in the STEM fields, that was her, her life mission. You talk to a lot of astronauts, and their mission is to go to space. Right. For her, space was just a springboard for something else. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. Bonnie Moore is in her 60s, divorced, and she wanted to stay in her big house. So she invited three other women to move in. It's a little bit like family, a little bit like roommates, a little bit like a sorority house. It just evolves. A golden girl's house. It's one way some baby boomer women are adapting to aging. On the next Morning Edition from NPR News. When it comes to parenting, can there be too much of a good thing? Come to find out, the answer is yes. It is possible to nurture too much. In addition to his work on nonverbal communication, Chris Segrin has also conducted research on the effects of overparenting and is back with us to tell us about his findings. So, overparenting, what, what is that? Overparenting is the scientific term that describes what we call colloquially helicopter parenting. It, it, what we define it as, as the application of developmentally inappropriate parenting strategies for young adults. And by developmentally inappropriate, we mean that they are strategies that offer too much control, too much guidance, too much problem solving for what the child really needs. So we're not just talking about giving them a few too many lollipops or cuddling them just a little too much. G give us no. some real examples of what you're For example, you're we're talking about, about stu uh, students who graduate from college and then have their parents help them negotiate with employers for a salary after college or parents who call their students professors up to argue about exam grades. But this must have been starting from, from way early on in their, in their childhood. It is likely that overparenting has its origins much earlier on, but it becomes a lot more visible in later uh, adolescence and early adulthood because it is actually appropriate to give the child a lot of guidance and nurturance when they're six or seven. It's the failure to back it off when they're 17, 18, 19 that creates overparenting. And what are the effects? I mean, these poor parents who think that they're probably doing the best for their kids they can, what, what are the effects of this? That's a good point. We have no doubt that the parents are enacting this with the best of intentions, but unfortunately what often happens is it creates a sense of narcissism, entitlement, poor coping, and actually dissatisfaction with family communication for the children. So when you say narcissism, you mean all about me, or? Exactly. The children often tend to see themselves as the center of the universe, if you will, because they're used to being treated that way. Yeah, so what, do, what can parents do about it? Well, the first thing is to be aware that it is in the child's best interest, especially as the child becomes a late adolescent and young adult, to deal with some frustrations and some struggles and solve some problems on his or her own. To put it bluntly, the parent should allow the child to trip and skin his or her knee every now and then. That's part of how we develop effective coping skills and self-efficacy and just part of being a mature adult. And to fail even. I mean, from a scientific point of view, failure is a huge part of, of how one advances. Exactly. And the, the, one of the difficulties of overparenting is this idea of always trying to protect the child from failure. By protecting the child from failure, the parent is effectively preventing the child from learning very important life lessons. And so this is based on research that you've done. This Correct. isn't just you walking around the street walking, Not noticing anecdotes. We've studied over 1,500 parent young adult dyads 
in about 40 of the 50 United States and about seven other countries in the world. Young adult dyads. Yes, by that we mean a parent and a young adult child, dyad being the pair, usually in the 18 to 23 age range. And I also understand that you've looked at the why. I mean, every parent is trying to do their darndest, right, to set up their kids to succeed in life and be all they can be. So, so do they know that they're doing something wrong? What, 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 why are they doing this? We don't believe that they know that they're doing something wrong. Again, we think they're doing this with the best of intention. The best way to illustrate this is if you've ever seen uh, these beauty pageant contests where five-year-olds walk on stage and they're all dressed up like 35-year-olds and you wonder who really wants to be the beauty queen and it's fairly apparent it's usually the parent who is off stage behind the scenes. This illustrates this idea of living vicariously through the child's successes and accomplishments. So one of our theories is that in overparenting, you start with a, what we call an enmeshed relationship between the parent and child, very, very close, very tight bonding. And what happens is that when the parent begins to experience some regrets in life, realizing I will never attain this status, this goal, this aspiration of mine, that generates a sense of anxiety that they project onto their child. Now you will not attain this. And so they try extra hard to make sure the child is successful in all of his or her endeavors. And what that parent is really doing is they're taking care of their own psyche more than they are their child's psyche. Well, that, that's kind of an indictment. Well, I, I don't have kids myself. I understand you don't have kids, so why did you get into this? Well, because I deal with parents so often of like young adults, for example. So I would have, early in my career as a department head, I would have parents calling me wanting to talk about why their child received a certain grade in a class or even a certain grade on an exam. And of course, because of FERPA regulations, I couldn't speak to them directly about that, but I was astonished at their willingness to get involved in the intricacies of their children's education here at U of A. And, and so, so how did you actually do the research for this? What were some of the steps you did? So what we did is we first created an online survey. So we wanted to be, be able to measure people throughout all of America. And so we created an online survey that the young adult college students would fill out. And then a link would be sent to one of their parents. Usually they picked their mother. And we usually we think that overparenting comes a little bit more from mothers than fathers, although fathers do it as well from time to time. And then they filled out a survey as well. And then we electronically matched them and then did statistical analyses to see which of the parent variables predicted certain outcomes for the child. And, and so the outcomes from the child, you, you saw a real correlation with the behavior from the parents when you started absolutely, to talk to them? Absolutely, absolutely. First thing we found is that the way overparenting manifests itself is through offering what we call tangible assistance, an extremely high quantity, intensive contact between parent and child advice and affect management, trying to control a child's emotions and make them very happy. And what all of this does is creates negative outcomes for the child. Unfortunately, we have to leave this fascinating topic there. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Statistics from 2010, the last year data is available, highlights the dangers of teenage driving. 16-year-olds have higher crash rates than drivers of any other age, and car crashes are the leading cause of death for teenagers in the United States. First responders and trauma center personnel see the first-hand gruesome consequences of these crashes, and now many of them are making extra efforts to prevent the crashes from ever happening at all. This mock car crash is something to just try to grab kids' attention. 
This time of year with prom and graduation can be the deadliest time of year for high school students with car accidents. And uh, we want them to just think about it beforehand. Don't sit on the ground. What's going on? Maybe I have sons where they're going to come here and take care of you. You stay right where you're at. Our CNA class, which is a certified nursing assistant, it's a dual credit class between us and Cochise College. This semester, the students are required to do a service learning project. Every bit of this has been organized by students. I'm Coral Kelly, I'm a junior at Team Stone High. I was a driver of one of the vehicles and I had died from the crash. At this time, we've got four patients. I'm going to go ahead and request that you see fire. Me, myself, in that accident, I honestly felt like it was real because one second, me and the people, me and my friends in the car, we were all talking and everything, and then the next second, like, the crash happened and I'm out the window dead. Can you hear me? My name is Michelle Thursby. Cover him up. We're going to take the roof off, Michelle, and then we're going to take the door. It was actually, honestly, I was prepared to, you know, go in the ambulance, be under this tarp while they're cutting and everything. But once I actually did it, I was like, wow, this is really scary. Like, I wouldn't want to be in this situation ever. I wouldn't want anyone in my family to be in this situation or any of my friends. So, like, I think that I'm just, I'm not going to text or drive or anything like that. I mean, stay focused on the road. Stay focused on what's important. All right, guys, all the seat belts are cut, right? Hold that roof. Don't let it fall on these girls. Get this one out first. We'll get the last one out there. Or the cutter. Personally, I'd take away the fact that your phone can wait. It's not that important. Nothing's more important than you getting from point A to point B safely. It's not that important. It can wait. Doug, get over here and help. Her name's Cody. I haven't been able to. Yeah, I haven't been able to get her to respond. I think it's important for students to see this crash to realize that it does happen and it could happen to you. Maybe they could prevent it if they understand how dramatic and how how it could change people's lives. Hang on, hang on. One, two, three. Do we have any family or friends? Any identification? No, she was with some friends, but they've already been transferred. Do we? What we I can't be dad. I'm only 17. I've got a date tonight. I'm supposed to grow up and have a wonderful life. I haven't even lived yet. I can't be dead. And that's what the whole event is for: is to try to get the kids to think before they get in the car with somebody who's been drinking or driving. Think before they drink or drive. And uh, when they are in the car, think about that text message can wait. Leave that phone alone. Please, don't bury me. That's our show. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, go online to our website at azpm.org. I'm Jane Pointer. Thanks for watching.